Department, and I'll call on Council Member Marie Wilsey. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor. Um, first item on the Admin and Finance agenda is item number two, approval to close Canton Street for four events. This will be presented by Chris Ward, Special Events Manager. Good evening. Um, um, as you remember, I presented at the August 10th Admin Committee meeting, and I'm back to review the three closures that I presented earlier, and there's a fourth one that we've added, the Youth Day Parade. So I will go through all the closures, and then if you have questions about specific ones, I'm more than happy to answer. The upcoming events for the fall season, we have Culinary on Canton, which is on 923. That's a Thursday evening. The Roswell Wine Festival is on October 3rd. That is a Sunday. The Youth Day Parade is on October 9th, that's a Saturday, and Running with the Turkeys is 1125, and that is Thanksgiving, also on a Thursday. The first is Culinary on Canton. As I said, it's on 923. The road closure will be Canton Street, same exact closure as Alive, so it's Magnolia to Norcross, Webb and Elizabeth Way. The closures will be from 530 to 930. The event itself runs 7 to 9. They're expecting 2,000 attendees and staffing will be 14 Roswell Police, four RDOT, and five Rec and Park. The next is our Roswell Wine Festival. That's on 10-3. The road closure is Canton Street, Magnolia to Woodstock, and Elizabeth Way. There's some staggered closings, so the 8 a.m. Um, to 6 p.m. will be Elizabeth Way. 10-30 to 6 is Magnolia to Norcross, and 12 to 5 is Norcross to Woodstock. The event runs from 1 to 5 p.m. They are expecting 3,000 people, and the staffing is 11 Roswell Police, 4 RDOT, and 2 Rec and Park. And here is the road closure. It's a little difficult to see. Um, there are ways to get out through the back, and there are officers at each of those where the little roadblocks are. This is the new one that we added. This is the Youth Day Parade. It's on 10 9 21. The road closure is Canton Street, Mimosa Boulevard. Magnolia in Woodstock Road. The one on Magnolia is from the Roswell United Methodist Church to, um, is on Mimosa from the Roswell United Methodist Church to Magnolia, then Magnolia to Canton, all of Canton, and then Woodstock up to Wave Tree. The uh, parade, the closure will be at 9.45 a.m. The parade starts at 10 and it ends at noon. They're expecting 3,500 people. The staffing is 21 uh, police, 17 RDOT, in all of recreation and parks. And that is the route. It goes into the park, but they do close up by Wave Tree. The final is running with the turkeys on 1125. The road closure is Canton Street, Magnolia to Woodstock and Elizabeth Way. North Lane will be the only closure. The South Lane will remain open. They will run up and then do what they call a switchback and run back in the same lane. The closure is 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. They're expecting 400 attendees. It will take 17 police, four RDOT, and two recreation and parks. The map. Are there any questions for me? Does council have any questions? Seeing no hands up, is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak? Seeing no one approach, I'll bring it back to council. Do I have a motion? Um, yes, Mayor. First of all, thank you, Chris, and thank you to the organizations who uh, are working on these events. Um, everyone mark your calendars and get your tickets. I know some of them sell out pretty quickly, so um, just hope, look forward to seeing everyone on Canton Street this fall. Um, and with that, motion to approve item number two. Motion to approve by Councilmember Wilsey. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Judy. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Back to you, Council Member Wilsey. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, item number three, approval of a resolution establishing the local higher job incentive program. Um, since we last discussed this item at committee um, a couple of weeks ago, we've had some additional information come forward that I think uh, deserves some additional research and discussion. So we'd like to uh, make a motion to defer this item back to the next admin and finance committee meeting. Thank you, Council Member Wilsey. I will open this up for council comment questions and then go to the public. Uh, do I have a second on the motion first? Second. Second by Council Member Tizer. Does the council have any comments? Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak? This will be deferred, so you'll have another opportunity. 
Seeing no one approach, we've got a motion, a second. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, item number four, approval of an ordinance to adopt a millage rate of 4.718 for FY 2022. This is the first reading and will be presented by Ryan Luckett, Director of Finance. Mr. Davidson. Thank you. This is an ordinance to adopt the millage rate. Now, therefore, the Mayor and Council of the City of Roswell wish to establish a millage rate of 4.718. The millage rate has a component of 4.618 mills for the general fund operating in capital improvements budget and a component of 0 0.10 mills for servicing bonded indebtedness. If approved, this would be the first reading. Mr. Luckett. Good evening, Mayor Council. Uh, we're here this evening for our first of three meetings concerning the FY 2022 millage rate. I have a brief presentation to uh, provide you some information regarding the millage rate. Uh, as you might remember, back on May 24th, uh, Mayor and Council adopted the FY 2022 budget, and that budget was based upon an estimated tax digest as well as a millage rate consistent with the prior year, which is 4.955 mills. Uh, we received a preliminary digest from Fulton County on July 2nd and brought that to you all at the July 28th committee meeting to discuss advertising, and we did receive guidance from the committee uh, to advertise a lower millage rate than the prior year. For this uh, year, we do have our three hearings scheduled. Our first one is today with our first reading of the millage rate ordinance. Uh, we'll be having a special called public hearing uh, two days from now on Wednesday, August 25th at 6 p.m. And then next Monday, August 30th at 7 p.m., we'll have our uh, final millage rates ordinance reading and adoption. Before I get into some of the details, I did just want to review really quickly um, kind of what a millage rate is and, and um, all the interesting information that goes along with that. Uh, so our millage rate is just another word for our property tax rate. Um, one mill is equal to $1 for every $1,000 of a property's assessed value. And in the state of Georgia, assessed value equals 40% of the fair market value of a piece of property. So as you can see on the far right side, a uh, home with a fair market value of $250,000 has an assessed value of 40, uh, of, excuse me, $100,000, uh, and one mill would be equal to $100 of property tax. Um, and as we point, at, point out at the bottom, um, property values are determined by the Fulton County Board of Assessors. Those are provided to the city, and we use that information to issue property tax bills. Residents of Roswell um, actually pay three separate um, property tax bills to three different jurisdictions. Um, Fulton County Schools has a millage rate, uh, Fulton County itself has a millage rate, and of course the city of Roswell has a separate millage rate. Out of the total property tax bill that a resident pays, about 54% of that is for Fulton County Schools, 31% is for Fulton County, and about 15% of that goes towards uh, the city of Roswell's budget. So for, the, uh, for this year, FY 2022, uh, there is proposed a millage rate reduction. And uh, the City of Roswell has two components to our total millage rate, a maintenance and operations and a debt service. Maintenance and operations goes to support basic city services like public safety, parks, um, roads, things like that. And our debt service portion of our millage rate goes to support uh, voter approved bonded debt. And um, for FY 2021, our total rate was 4.955, and that consisted of a maintenance and operations portion of 4.705, and a debt service portion of 0.25. Uh, for FY 2022, uh, according to the guidance we received at committee, um, we have lowered both components of the millage rate. Uh, the MO rate has been reduced to eliminate any revenue in excess of the approved budget on the MO side. And the debt rate has been reduced um, to a portion that's needed in conjunction with it, uh, our fund balance to pay off our remaining debt through 2024. So, based on that guidance we received at committee, that equates to a maintenance and operations millage rate of 4.618 and a debt service rate of 0.1, which is a total millage rate of 4.718, representing a 4.8% reduction from the prior year. State law does require cities and counties to calculate a rollback millage rate, 
And basically what that means is you take the prior year's millage rate and you subtract the millage equivalent of the inflationary or a reassessment increase included in the digest over the prior year. Um, that applies only to the MNO rate, not the total rate. And so based on the information we have this year, the city's rollback rate is 4.581. Um, because the MNO rate is higher than the rollback rate, we were required uh, to advertise a tax increase, despite the fact that the city will collect less property tax revenue overall um, than the prior year. I also wanted to uh, review really quickly some information about our digest for our 20, tax year 2021. Um, this slide shows you the gross property tax digest um, for all properties in the city. And as you can see overall, the digest grew by $361 million, or 5.8%. Um, residential property grew by 6.1%, commercial 45 and the other minor portion of our digest by 9.5%. When you break our total digest down by property type, you can see that as of tax year 2021, residential properties make up 73% of our total digest, commercial properties make up 24%, and other uh, categories make up 3%. And that's a slight increase in residential from the prior year. The City of Roswell also offers um, several homestead exemptions that are available to our residents. Um, those residents age 65 and over qualify for a $2,000 reduction in their assessed value. Those 65 and over with an adjusted gross income of less than $40,000 annually qualify for a $20,000 reduction in their assessed value. And we also recognize the Federal Disabled Veteran um, exemption which has a value of $85,645 off your assessed value. And then finally, the city offers a floating homestead exemption. Um, all of these exemptions combined total $751 million, and that is the equivalent of about $3.7 million in savings and tax savings for residents, or an average of about $129 per household. When we take our digest information and look at what that means in terms of revenues, uh, this chart uh, compares our 2022 estimate to our actual from 2021. And as you can see, um, overall we are expected to collect about $60,000 less than uh, FY 2021. And this is based on the proposed millage rate of 4.718. That's about a, it's about a 3.1% increase in the general fund and a 57.6% decrease in our debt service fund for an overall percent decrease of 0.2%. When we compare our FY 2022 budget, approved budget, versus our 2022 estimate, uh, again, this is based on the proposed millage rate of 4.718. Uh, you can see that there is, we basically eliminated any variance in the general fund, um, so we are expect to collect what we budgeted. And on the debt service side, we are expecting to collect about $840,000 less than our 2022 budget. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the revenues that we expect to collect in 2022 with that reduced rate, in conjunction with our fund balance and our debt service fund, will provide enough revenues to pay off our debt service uh, through 2024. The next chart gives you a 10-year history of our millage rate here in Roswell, and you can see it's steadily decreased overall um, from 2012, I'm sorry, from 2012 uh, to the proposed rate today. And when you compare that to our surrounding neighbors, you can see that both on an MNO basis as well as a total rate basis, uh, the city of Roswell has the second lowest millage rate among uh, North Fulton cities. So to summarize, uh, property tax digest overall has increased by 5.8%. Uh, homestead exemptions have reduced the digest value by about $751 million, which is about 13% of our total digest. In terms of our property tax revenues in FY 2022, our MNO rate has been reduced to bring the estimated general fund revenues in line with our 22 budgeted amount. Uh, the debt rate has been reduced. And as I mentioned, revenues in combination with our fund balance will be used to service our bonded debt. 
So our recommended millage rate of 4.718 mills, um, and as I mentioned, that's a 4.8% reduction from the prior year. Next steps, as I said, uh, Wednesday the 25th, and we have a public hearing at 6 p.m., as well as our second uh, reading of the millage rate ordinance on Monday, August 30th at 7 p.m. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Does council have any questions, comments for Mr. Luckett? Yes, Council Member Hall. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Mayor Henry. Ryan, thank you for the presentation, and it, this is always such a big subject to wrap your head around if, if you're not necessarily in, in numbers. Um, and I'm in numbers, and I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. Uh, so our current millage rate is 4.955, and the proposed 0.237 mills decrease is comprised of two components. Point one zero of that is the debt service, and that's because we've just collected more money over time and we don't need to be collecting at 0.25, so that makes sense and I can follow that very easily. The point one three seven uh, decrease, we're, uh, our tax digest came in 600,000 higher. Is that, does that represent the 600,000 increase, so our budget didn't change. We still have the same budget, but it's because we're getting more revenue from the actual tax digest. Right, the, ta the tax digest grew by more than we anticipated as part of the budget, and so to eliminate that positive variance, um, that brings down the millage rate for the MNO side, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, Council Member Tizer. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, when the state legislature and our own Senator Albers, uh, who was a sponsor of the bill, set up the new method of valuation, the intent was for cities to not have windfalls just because property values went up. And the idea was that you would prepare your budget and then adjust your millage rate either up or down, but, but hopefully down, because you have been reasonable stewards of taxpayer money. Uh, in this case, what's happening is, as Council Member Hall just said, we're reducing the debt service amount because uh, we don't need as much as we originally thought to service the debt. And we're reducing the maintenance and operating uh, portion of the millage rate to match our budget. And that's the, the whole purpose of how that whole process is supposed to work. And so. We pass a budget, then we match our millage rate to what that budget's needs are. Um, and in this case, um, you know, we're able to bring it down uh, as, as we've recommended. That matches exactly to the budget. Um, and so uh, if I'm correct, I think um, uh, this is the lowest millage rate since 1988? That's correct. And um, that's, that's what the process is supposed to yield. So uh, thanks for all the great work, and uh, um, it's, it's interesting to see how the process actually, uh, actually comes across in, uh, in the real world. Additional comments? Yes, Council Member Palermo. Thank you, Mayor Henry. Ryan, as always, great, uh, great presentation, and thank you for all the information and hard work from you and your department. Could you please go to the slide that describes the, the, rollback, the rollback rate? Thank you. So, so at, at the end of the day, this is, so Councilman Tizer has talked a little bit about the, the intent, et cetera, but I think it is really important that we focus more on the, the total taxes and specifically, too, looking at what that rollback is to avoid this, this legal tax increase, the same, uh, same tax increase that we have faced in, uh, in previous years as well. Really, I am very happy that we're looking at reducing the millage rate. I think that's a good thing. That's something that I've advocated for the last three consecutive years. The last three consecutive years I've advocated for reducing the millage rate. And because just like this year, in those previous years, I feel there was administration, administrative spending that wasn't beneficial to taxpayers. I felt this council really needs to do a, a better job of, of making tough decisions. And if we're not willing to make those tough decisions, then we need to really return money back to the taxpayers. And so, although I'm certainly happy that we're reducing the millage rate, it certainly is very related to the fact that just ultimately 
property values have gone up, in which case, in which case residents, even if the millage rate goes down, that doesn't necessarily mean that their taxes are going down. It could mean the opposite. And so what I, what I here will support is reducing it even further. Basically, I feel we need to, we need to really more than double what the de decrease proposed is. So, so we've proposed a decrease of 0.237 mils. And, and in reality, that number should be at least doubled. I think it actually should be more than doubled, uh, but, but at, at least doubled and at least getting us to the rollback rate to, uh, to avoid another, another tax increase and, and show that we really are better stewards of, of taxpayer money. So uh, I, I know there wasn't support for a greater reduction the last three years, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping tonight there, there is support to, to, uh, to really show the residents that, that we are fighting for them and their tax bills and that we do bring it back down lower to the rollback rate. Councilmember Tizer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I think we'd all like to lower the millage rate even lower than it was uh, in 1988. Uh, we've already litigated a budget. Uh, it's the policy of this council. And um, uh, I think I would have gladly entertained another millage rate uh, it, uh, reduction uh, had I known where that money would be coming from. Um, and uh, if, you know, really wish that we had, if, if you were interested in doing that, uh, that you'd presented us in advance with, uh, with your ideas on how to take another $900,000 uh, out of the budget. Um, that, we don't have that, and so, uh, as I said earlier, the intent here is to match revenue with the approved budget, uh, and that's what we're here to do tonight. Council Member Zapata. Thank you, Mayor. So, well, you know, this is just a consequence of the, just follow what the budget dictated. Um, you know, I remember me and other council members proposed a, a reduction on the budget that was presented, uh, you know, before the vote in June. So we all knew about it, you know, around $1.6 million, either reduce it or invest it in better ways. Um, just to give you a quick example, we were proposing to invest this um, part of this into the regular basic parks and rec maintenance, which was cut from 385,000 to only only $75,000. So that is not acceptable. And I didn't vote, like some of my colleagues here, we didn't vote for this budget for this specific reason. reason. You either cut the budget and save taxpayer money, or two, you invest where the community really wants the money to be invested. So, uh, and we did propose. So there is a proposal before voting in June, the 2022 budget. So um, again, since, and also I want to point out here that, you know, property tax rate in dollar amount, in dollar amount went up, is the highest general fund revenue from the property tax rate, the highest ever, at least for the last three years, 19, 20, 21, and this proposed 22. So, um, you know, it's great to cut the military rate, but you have to tell the whole story. And the whole story is that the general fund revenue from property tax is higher than ever. So, um, so I do support since we didn't get support to cut the budget or reallocate to make better investment for the community, then I do support to go even farther and, uh, and uh, reduce even more the millage rate so um, we can save at this point, since the budget has been already voted, what we can do is to save even more money to the, to the taxpayers. Um, so, you know, keep all this in mind and don't just think about me, think about the property tax in dollar amount, how much the city is collecting year after year, how much is growing, and how much less investment is, are we making in, a, in a basic maintenance of our park system. So we are short $310,000 from the budget that the department requested, and only again $75,000 were approved, which uh, I think is not acceptable for the city of Roswell. Councilmember Palermo. 
Thank you, Mayor Henry, and uh, and I certainly echo Councilman Zapata's uh, sentiment. And just just really as another example is is the fact that. Uh, in that long list of proposals of, of how we could sharpen our pen pencil and reduce some expenses back in the June uh, budget budget vote and, and uh, discussion was, for example, we there was a proposal for hundreds of thousands of dollars of staff travel cut for uh, excluding, the proposal was excluding um, first responders. So excluding first responders, cutting cutting travel for uh, between July 1st, 2021 and June 30th, 2022. If things were getting better uh, with, with um, you know, COVID, the economy, everything else, we could always look at adding the money there. But the real issue with having money, with having money going towards, towards something that even might not end up being used is there's the opportunity for that to be reallocated without uh, public input. So there's a lot of benefits to having a lower budget and then if or when needed, uh, allocating the budget at that point. So, so that's why I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to properly do a rollback, greatly increase the, uh, the proposed uh, millage, millage rate reduction and, and really make, make up for what I think we should have done the last three years. So again, I, I hope there's support tonight to, uh, to, to really further, further decrease this millage rate and, and stop the tax increase to really bring us to the rollback. Additional comments? Yes, Council Member Hall. Thank you, and, and I would like to add that we do have the opportunity for amended budgets, especially given the fact that we have an additional 5.7 million um, in the American Rescue Plan funds that can be allocated towards uh, items that were or are in the budget plan, so that would further support um, me wanting to get back to the rollback rate. Additional comments from council? Yes, council member Wilsey. Um, yes, just a question for director Luckett and this is just, just a clarifying question that the current recommended millage rate is based on the budget that was approved by this mayor and council? Correct. That's correct. And uh, going back to the millage rate would not meet that approved budget. Is that correct as well? Right, we would have, if we reduce the millage rate further beyond the proposed rate, we would either have to reduce expenditures in the budget or recognize additional revenue above what we budgeted somewhere else. Okay, all right, thank you very much. I just wanted to clarify that, thank you. Additional comments, questions from council? Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak? Seeing no one approach, um, and council has had the opportunity to make uh, comments, ask questions. There is no public input, so I'll ask for a motion. A motion to approve the first reading of the millage rate proposed at 4.718 for FY 2022. Motion by council member Wilsey. Do I have a second? Second. Second by council member Tizer. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is Council Member Tizer, Wilsey, and Judy. All those opposed, that would be Zapata, Hall, and Palermo. I will break the tie in favor of the millage rate and in favor of the motion. So it carries four to three. Back to you, Council Member Wilsey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Henry. Item number five. Approval of a resolution to authorize the mayor of the city of Roswell to execute loan modification documents for the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority, GFA, Solid Waste <coughs> Transfer Station loan. This will be presented by Director Ryan Luckett. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this item is related to the uh, new solid waste transfer station that was approved by Mayor and Council, a capital project a couple of years ago. Uh, back in February, you all approved a uh, Georgia Environmental Finance Authority loan to finance the construction of the station. Uh, there's been one minor change to the overall project plan, and that is that the original scheduled completion date was December 2021. Um, the revised completion date is now July 2022. And because of that change, GFA requires us to modify the loan documents and obtain your all's approval again. Um, so that is the only change that this uh, loan modification is, and um, glad to answer any questions. 
anyone have any questions? Council have any questions for Mr. Luckett? Comments? Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak? Do I have a motion? Uh, yes, Mayor. Motion to approve item number five. Motion to approve by Council Member Wilsey. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Judy. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we will go to Community Development Department. Council Member Hall. Thank you, Mayor Henry. Item number six, approval of CU 2021-2600, 37 Magnolia Street, changes to previously approved site plan for a hotel, presented by Ms. Dibel. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This will be a combined joint effort between Community Development Department, the Fire Department, and the Transportation Department presentation. This is a um, site plan change for the Roswell Boutique Hotel. They're located at 37 Magnolia Street, 895 Mimosa Boulevard, and 26 Webb. The property is currently zoned DS, which is downtown Shopfront. Some background on the, pro um, the proposed project. In 2017, a conditional use was approved for the hotel, um, which contained the addresses of 37 Magnolia, 895 Mimosa, and 34 Webb. In 2018, a modification to the approved site plan um, was approved, and that included the addition of the parcel at 26 Webb Street. In 2020, a modification to the site plan of was, was approved for the mixed-use building to be located at 37 Webb. Oh, sorry, Magnolia. So um, this is the zoning of the property. It is DS. The parcels in blue are the is the proposed project. The 2035 comprehensive plan, the project complies with the plan. If the character area is within the historic area town center downtown. It states that the area shall continue to serve as a destination point for the city. And it looks to promote mixed use development and redevelopment. The historic district master plan, as you know, was adopted. Um, this property, there are no specific requirements subject per the master plan for this, pro for this proposed area. The adjacent properties to the north the commer is commercial use zone downtown shopfront. To the south, you have commercial use across Magnolia zoned at downtown mixed use and a residential property zoned at DH downtown house. To the east, you have commercial use zoned at downtown shopfront. And to the west, you have a senior living facility across Mimosa, zoned downtown residential, and a residential um, uses on web zoned RS6, single family. Here's an aerial of the property, which is what I just described related to the um, adjacent properties surrounding the proposed hotel development. A little bit about the site plan. It's a mixed use building with 287,000 plus square feet three and a half stories, 125 room boutique hotel, 2,435 square feet for retail, 18,400 plus square feet of restaurant, 38,000 plus square feet of office, 14,800 some plus square feet for event space. Proposed parking is 397 spaces with 100 spaces designated as free public parking. There are two trash compactors, one for the hotel and the other one located on the 26 web parcel, which will be used as a common compactor for the existing businesses. And the trees to be located on the property include elm, black gum, oak, maple, crepe myrtle, and holly. This is the proposed site plan. As you can see, they um, have access. I'll also zoom in here. They have access off of Magnolia Street they have access off of Mimosa, and they are also using the West Alley um, access point in the rear. The tree replacement plan, as you can see, there are trees surrounding the property on all sides, smaller ones on Magnolia and Mimosa. And I'll turn it over to fire.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is uh, our fire access plan. We have access on Magnolia and Mimosa, but our aerial fire apparatus access location will be Magnolia and a small portion of Mimosa. After meeting with the developers, we, we realized that the life safety um, issue would be more on Magnolia, Magnolia, excuse me, than it would be on Mimosa. So we changed our aerial apparatus access location, as you can see in the gold, as opposed to the red. We still have access on all of the locations around the building, but our aerial apparatus access will be Magnolia and um, Mimosa. Uh, because of the our aerial apparatus access, we cannot have large trees or power lines blocking our access to uh, the roof or to the windows for uh, emergency access. And the trees that will be on Magnolia will be not taller than the first story of the building. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Henry, uh, Council Members, Muhammad and I uh, wanted to provide you a quick summary of uh, relevant issues and concerns we have the with the revised site plan uh, for the boutique hotel before you tonight. Uh, first, because I know this is a hot topic, uh, sidewalk requirements. So the revised site plan uh, shows uh, continuous eight-foot sidewalks along the Mimosa Boulevard and the Webb Street frontage uh, per the previously approved site conditions and a continuous 10-foot sidewalk along Magnolia Street. The 10 foot sidewalk exceeds the original council approved condition uh, for the hotel in 2018. Recently passed UDC amendments uh, would require this project if it were needed to construct a multi use trail per the hub and spoke map in the adopted bicycle and pedestrian master plan. And there is a trail shown on this side of Magnolia Street uh, between Mimosa and Canton. The 10 foot sidewalk is measured from the back of curb to the face of the building. Uh, the two primary reasons transportation made this request and for the 10 feet on the revised site plan is to accommodate the current code and to also recognize, and I'll bring your attention uh, to this detail, uh, the distance measured from the back of curb uh, to the face of the building is that 10 feet. Uh, there are multiple four by four tree grates uh, located along the Magnolia frontage as seen on the site plan on your screen. Uh, next, there's a uh, one of the three access points on the public right-of-way is a proposed driveway uh, into the parking deck off of Magnolia Street. Uh, as many of you know, this is an extremely congested area in a.m. and p.m. peak hours. Uh, the driveway is proposed right in, right out, as you see on the screen, uh, with lefts prohibited due to the proximity uh, to two adjacent traffic signals at Mimosa and Magnolia and at uh, State Route 9 and Canton Street. The number of vehicles making this right turn during the highest peak hour of the day is estimated at 59 vehicles and over a daily 24 hour period will be 535 vehicles. These projections are based on industry collected data around the country to estimate the number of trips that are being generated by uh, the property, the 125 hotel rooms, the retail and the office. Uh, the submitted traffic study acknowledges that the site exceeded the industry standard for a right turn lane four of 100 vehicles per day by more than five times. We're comparing the 535 to the 100. Uh, the applicant's traffic study recommends that the right turn lane should not be constructed here for several reasons. Staff disagrees with the reasoning uh, and wants to avoid further degradation to operational and safety challenges we are already having along this seg segment of Magnolia. Uh, frankly, there's nothing in our existing code that directs staff to review traffic studies and impacts associated with developments like this any differently, uh, whether they are in the historic district or outside the historic district. Uh, the warranted right turn lane currently shown on the site plan, as you can see on the screen, uh, is shown in order to mitigate the increase in traffic volumes in an already congested area and prevent further negative impacts to adjacent intersections like Nina Can. 
Lastly, stay there. Lastly, uh, this site has two proposed access points along Mimosa and we'll, we'll be increasing the traffic volumes at the tr existing traffic signal of Mimosa and Magnolia due to the right in right out driveway on Magnolia. All vehicles that are wanting to make that left out or that left in uh, would be making those turning movements at this signal. Uh, per the traffic study, the southbound traffic on Mimosa in the opening year projected at 2024 would increase by 19% uh, in the morning peak hour by 43% and by 36% in the Sunday midday peak hour. Uh, volumes from the traffic study show traffic demand and average queue lengths longer than 170 feet on Mimosa Boulevard, which prevents the turn lanes from operating as efficiently as they should. Uh, staff is recommending a project improvement, as you can see on the screen, to lengthen the existing through right lane on Mimosa, approximately 150 feet as shown on the graphic. This improvement will provide additional capacity along Mimosa Boulevard preventing the left turning cars, not allowing cars into the through light lane and vice versa. I have uh, next screen. I hope this graphic uh, illustrates the concept that we're trying to uh, alleviate here. Uh, graphic on the left would be not building the project improvement. Graphic on the right would be building the project improvement. Uh, this improvement would also allow the intersection to give an increased percentage of green time to vehicles along Magnolia and Pine Grove Road, which directly benefits all Roswell residents that are using Pine Grove Road to and from their homes. Uh, the warranted right turn lane along Magnolia and the staff condition for an extension of the through right on Mimosa are based on an objective review of the traffic volumes estimated to be generated based on an average of similar installations across the country. Uh, staff feels both of these improvements are important for this area where existing traffic congestion leads to unsafe conditions for all road users, uh, including vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles. Staff recommends approval with the following conditions. So most, a lot of these conditions were brought forward from the 2018 approval uh, with some modifications. The owner developer shall provide the 50 public parking spaces to the city on the public par um, parking on the hotel property and in addition to the required parking spaces shall not be used for a valet or hotel guest parking. And these spaces shall always remain open for public use. Number two, a signed parking agreement shall be submitted to the city indicating the 50 parking spaces for the city prior to the issuance of the LDP. Number three, the owner developer shall install a trash compactor pad for sanitation as part of the proposed development as approved by the Environmental Public Works Department. Number four, West Alley shall remain a two-way street. The alley shall remain in Kurtz function as required by the Roswell Transportation Department. Number five, all lighting shall meet the Historic District Design Guidelines and be approved by the Historic Preservation Commission. Number six, the owner developer shall donate right away or grant a permanent, e permanent easement up to one foot behind any sidewalk constructed on private property prior to the issuance of a CO for the boutique hotel. Number seven, all parking spaces located on a public right away must be ac accessible to the public and not limited to a single tenant. Number eight, the owner developer shall provide a pedestrian connectivity to the adjacent parcels provided the adjacent parcel owner supports the connection. Number nine, the owner developer should provide a minimum of eight foot sidewalk along Webb and Mimosa and a minimum of eight foot sidewalk along Magnolia. Number 10, all delivery trucks and tour buses shall be prohibited from directly servicing the hotel by parking or unloading on Magnolia. After the CO is approved, trucks or buses parking loading or unloading while servicing the hotel that are unable to fit under the hotel must do so on Mimosa Boulevard extension or web. Number 11, the owner developer shall develop the property in substantial accordance with the site plan received on August 10th, 2021. The project number 12, the project shall not exceed 125 room hotel, mixed use commercial at 37 Magnolia, 895 Mimosa, 26 web and alley in accordance with the UDC. Number 13, due to the development's impact on the operations of the intersection of Magnolia and Mimosa, the city requires the applicant to construct an extension to the southbound through right turn lane 
to accommodate the additional traffic on this approach, queuing back up north on Mimosa, as well as alleviate the imposed additional delay. According to the GDOT regulations for driveway and encroachment control with the posted speed limit and the ADTs on Mimosa Boulevard, the shared through right turn lane will need to have a 50 foot taper and 160 feet storage length at a minimum. Now, from the 2018 approval, we did remove some conditions, so we wanted to let you know those. These were removed based on duplication, the revised plans, and the traffic study. So West Alley shall remain a two-way street. We had that in there twice. Um, and the owner developer shall use the access from West Alley as an entrance and exit as required by the Roswell DOT. Um, these were also removed um, due to the fact that it also included 34 web. And the last one was that they had to resubmit a traffic study, which the applicant did do. Before I finalize um, or finish my presentation, I do want to make a comment, and I think David, maybe this might be more for you. Um, the site plan that we've got in here, which is for August 10th, based on this condition, does indicate 100 public parking spaces. The condition back in 2018 was for 50 parking spaces because that was what they were proposing at the time. So if they, um, if council so chooses to approve the revised site plan modification, I'm not sure if you're going to want to update that condition number one to indicate the 100 public parking spaces. Do you have any questions for staff? Mr. Davidson. I would recommend amending that condition also if council's gonna approve this. Thank you. Um, I have a question about a lack of condition <laughs> uh, regarding the street trees. So um, the fire department is talking uh, about a site plan where they're requiring trees not be any taller than the first two stories. I did not see that in a condition. Um, but then I have questions about the proposal of that condition. So regarding that condition, I believe the trees, and I let the applicant speak to this, I believe due to the fact that they've spoken with the fire, a lot of the trees that they show on Magnolia and Mimosa um, should meet the aerial apparatus um, height limit. Is that what I want to say, height limit? We, um, so I can let the applicant speak to that, but since they're shown on this plan, and we can add that as a condition if you so choose, but the plan that they have here, and. It's very hard to read. I think I have it's zoomed in here. No, it's not. It does say the height. You can you can sort of see it. Height. The what they're showing on there was the height to meet the aerial apparatus requirement. So and I can let the app, um, applicant address that as well. Well, we'll hear from the applicant mm -hmm. in a minute. But um, it, this is the problem I've got. Um, this requirement by the fire department is counterproductive to what we've been trying to do with street trees, and we've been fighting GDOT for years about street trees putting sizable trees in that actually provide shade. Um, and then, you know, over our sidewalks as well. And then with this, you know, they really do help to deal with the mass and scale of a project. So what I'm, what I'm at, basically what I'm asking and stating is, um, I believe that this requirement is counterproductive to what this council and policy has been to create large street trees, shaded areas. And so if that is the intention of our fire department, I would strongly recommend that we have a work session and talk about street trees and how those relate to our projects because clearly I think there's a division between what council is seeking and what our fire department is seeking. So we'll have to come to some sort of resolution. So I would not propose putting that condition in. I'm, I'm um, objecting to the condition in general. I believe this whole facility will be sprinkled. I'm not sure what the proper term of that will be. And I'm sure that there are, are a lot of other areas in the city where trees are growing larger than um, the second story and we deal with it when we're dealing with fires. So I think that uh, oftentimes, especially in our historic district, there are issues that we just have to learn to deal with because that's the way it is. It's, for example, like, you know, living in any planned out um, city, there are going to be areas that are they optimal? Maybe not. 
Um, and how do we get around that? So if you require sprinklers in interior, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm just, I'm sorry, I, I just have an issue with that. And I would suggest to this council that um, we revisit that uh, in a work session. Um, and I would also suggest that we not include that requirement this evening. But um, I will wait to hear from you all. Are there other, yes, Council Member Tizer. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Dybel, can you, uh, can you let us know um, how wide are the sidewalks on Webb Street today? Currently on Webb Street today? It's a trick question. I don't, on the, there, I was gonna to, say, I don't know if there is one there, on the parcel at the 26th Webb. That's correct, there are no sidewalks on Webb Street today. <laughs> Thank you. So, so my, my wife, my dog and I uh, will be grateful when there's a sidewalk on Webb Street. Um, and also very grateful that we'll see uh, sidewalks down Mimosa and a wide enough uh, place to walk on the other side of the block up Magnolia. So all that's great. Um, I'd like to, I don't know uh, who we've got here, you know, from the public that'll speak, but I know we have a letter <clears throat> from the uh, Providence Townhome HOA board, um, very eager to see the project get started. Um, I, can, I, can, I can share with you that um, Mrs. Tizer and myself are very eager to see uh, this piece of property finally turned into something that we can all be proud of. But um, Mr. Brady is there, and I'm sure he'll come up and speak in a minute. Uh, he's, he's another neighbor. So this one is welcomed, I think, uh, from that standpoint, because we're gonna get the connectivity, the sidewalks, the movement that, that we've wanted in the area for quite a long time. Council Member Palermo. Thank you, Mayor Henry. So uh, I definitely feel like this is Groundhog Day since I've already voted in support of a boutique hotel in this location three times. So, uh, so definitely, uh, definitely having some deja vu. But uh, that being said, I think good, important discussion. And um, and I, and, I, and I do have some questions. I first want to kind of share my share my thoughts on kind of why I'm asking these questions. And and I think they're probably going to be leaning a little more towards towards transportation. But uh, you know, I'm really focused on expanding our walkable downtown and bringing more destinations to our city. And I feel a walkable boutique hotel, I think, can can help towards those goals. In so in 2017, when I had motioned to approve the boutique hotel here, RDOT had requested a turn lane. And there was consensus among council in the discussion that there was concerns a turn lane would potentially impact really the pedestrian safety and walkability right there um, and, and potentially encouraging some of the, uh, the, the cut through traffic. And at that time, the request was on just Magnolia. And now I'm seeing with that picture, it sounds like there's a request on Magnolia and Mimosa Boulevard for additional lanes or, or lane lengths, et, et cetera. So I guess, one thing I'll want to kind of hear from, from RDOT is, is kind of that part of the discussion with the perspective on knowing we need a balance. We want to, we want to balance, you know, of course, as convenient as possible for, for cars driving and safe, certainly safe as possible for cars driving, but also as safe as possible for, for pedestrians as, as well as really expanding that walkability. So, so that's kind of one question I have uh, there and just kind of discussion I want this whole council to have. The other, the other one is, so of course I'm really glad to see those, uh, those sidewalk conditions that I had added back in 2017, uh, uh, continuing there. And, uh, and with that, and, and this will be, I guess I should have saved this for the applicant, but since I already started talking, um, what I'd wanna see is given the fact that I've, what I've heard is Magnolia is actually gonna be 10 feet, not eight feet, I would like to see the condition to be updated so that it is remaining eight feet on uh, Mimosa and Webb and increasing to 10 feet on Magnolia. And so I guess my question, that'll be my question for the applicant, um, see if there are any concerns. But th that's, that's, that's all my comments I had. And I guess question for you, RDOT, and whether you wanna answer it right now or you prefer to answer it after the applicant speaks. I just wanna make sure we're discussing that tonight. Just to clarify, uh, the right turn lane uh, we spoke about in order. The right turn lane we spoke about in 2017, it was a staff recommendation that was not uh, imposed by council as a condition. That was a right turn lane on Magnolia at the signal of Mimosa. 
so that is not a request tonight. Um, I have a laser on my, on my pointer, but you're not gonna be able to see it. That is a right turn lane uh, approximately where my laser is right now approaching the signal. Uh, what we're discussing tonight is the right turn lane is shown on their site plan, so a right turn lane entering their driveway, entering their parking deck on Magnolia as a right in, right out. And we are discussing a southbound extension of the existing through right lane as shown on the graphic. Uh, southbound on Mimosa Boulevard approaching the signal. Uh, there is approximately room for three cars there right now. We would like to extend that to accommodate, uh, to mitigate basically the increased trips that the development's proposing. So you've, you've answered my question on the Magnolia side. So basically it's a different right turn into the entrance and it makes sense on why you'd ask for a different request given the, the site plan's different. So I guess help me understand why there's the request on Mimosa that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Why is, why is that a new request? It's based on access changes. It's based on different uses. It's based on it's based on a different traffic study. Uh, we took an objective look at what they were proposing tonight, and are bringing forward to you the the two things that we think need to be in place in order to help uh, not degrade and not further harm this area: the right turn lane into the parking deck off Magnolia and the southbound extension of the through right, as shown on the screen. Councilmember Hall. Thank you, Mayor Henry. Actually, Council Member Palermo got my question, so I'm good. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Tizer. Thank you. Uh, neglected to say, um, I'm going to, uh, after the applicant speaks, I'll make a proposal for uh, item number 13 uh, on their um, conditions list. And so, um, you know, uh, it, you'll hear it when the time's right. Council Member Wilsey. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor, and this is also a question for Mr. Del Ross. Um, just a question regarding turn lanes, what the typical practice has been regarding turn lanes in the historic district, and... From SAS perspective, that? Yes. Uh, we do not evaluate developments any differently, whether they are in the historic district or not. Uh, we do not evaluate level of service. We do not evaluate queues, uh, traffic volumes any differently, whether the development's located in East Roswell or West Roswell or North Roswell or South Roswell. Uh, it's an objective look, and it's our recommendation for what we think uh, needs to be done to mitigate the increased trips, specifically at this intersection, of the volumes that are heading south that are approaching that signal. So those decisions are not location-specific, but based simply on traffic flow and speeds and? Uh, based simply on the numbers given in their traffic study that we've agreed to as far as it's, it's, uh, it's a representation of what we predict these conditions will be like in three years when it's built. Uh, it's based on a nationwide collection of data for what a 125 hotel <laughs> uh, room boutique hotel will actually generate as far as the, the volumes going in, volumes going out with the other uses that they're proposing. But again, those aren't location specific or specific to a character Those are not location area, specific. So. That's an aggregate okay. of, of sure. what across the country looks like. Okay, thank you. Yes. Council Member Palermo. Thank you, Mayor Henry. So uh, one comment, one question, I think. First of all, thank you for providing that. I know you're, you're always gonna look at it a very analytical and engineering perspective, which, which I appreciate and we, we need to hear. And at the same time as we make decisions, I think we do have to take into account locations because, uh, you know, of course, let's just use an even clearer example. Canton Street is a uh, is a place that is going to be a little uh, a little unique and, and might not be you know the most appropriate for adding a new turn lane and, and things like that. So I, I think that's something this council should discuss. But actually, a question I had, and I can't remember if you, it was you, Mr. Del Ross, or Mr. Ralph had brought it up to me. But when I when I was with one of you asking just some questions on this to make sure I was prepared. When on, Mag on Magnolia, there was some discussion around the sidewalk. And so let's, let's assume, uh, or hypothetically, let's just say the, the applicant supports the 10 foot condition as, as was discussed. And let's, let's hypothetically assume that this council chooses to approve the, uh, the site plan change. I, I think one of you two had brought up that the 10 foot sidewalk, it was questionable on 
would it all be right of way or something along those lines? Basically, I guess, let me, let me just more directly ask my question. The proposed sidewalk, would that be 100% public access, you know, public can be walking on that sidewalk at all times? Or is that something where they might, where it might be a sidewalk, but the public can only access five feet of it? Uh, so I recommend you ask that question to the applicant, but my understanding is what their site plan is showing is a 100% public right of way from the back of curve all the way to the face of their building. Excellent, thank you. Council Member Judy. Oh. Mr. Del Ross, real quick, um, back to the stacking picture with the turn lane. Um, are we worried about at all that lane because that's a long light. I sat there the other day after church. Are we worried about all that lane stacking since it's going to stack there and people cutting through the old folks' home there to um, Pine Grove? Because um, I, I think that that could turn into something kind of dangerous if not um, <clears throat> thought about. Councilmember Judy, I agree with the concern. I guess my my question would be: I, I don't understand why the increased uh, storage would encourage that. If someone's willing to do that, someone has that access to do that today. Well, I would just say it, you could get more cars cutting through there because of the. If you look there, you can only have two, and if that one stopped right there, that can't get there. But a whole line of cars could go right around and go through there. Um, I, just a thought, I, I just, I, from when that came up, I immediately thought about that. So anyway, just wanted to bring that up. Council Member Zapata. Thank you, Mayor. So first of all, welcome back to all of you who are here in 2017. 2017. So actually, what a coincidence, in three days will be the third anniversary of the approval of modification of the site plan from the 2017 conditional use was August 27. So for three days, we're missing the third year anniversary, so happy birthday. So again, you know, here we are, like Councilor Palermo said, deja vu, uh, four years passed by, and I know, I think at least three hotels have been built in two or three miles. I know Windward have one brand new, on the west, on the east side. We have two, I guess, in Mansell. And here we are again, 2021, talking about the boutique hotel. But well, welcome back again. So I think that transportation brought up a good point, uh, which is uh, intersection improvement. So um, I understand what was explained here by transportation, and I'm looking forward to see the position of the applicant regarding uh, an uh, Intersection, intersection improvement. Thank you. Additional comments, questions with staff before I open this up to the applicant. Would the applicant please come forward? Or applicants, Ooh. applicant group. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Mr. Davidson, Ms. Dival, staff, Mr. Fisher, who I don't believe I've ever had the opportunity of meeting, Mr. Davidson. Uh, my name is Kurt Hilbert. For those that uh, do not know me, I am with the Hilbert Law Firm located just down the street here on 205 Norcross Street uh, in Roswell. It is my honor and privilege to represent the applicant West Alley LLC with respect to approval of this modified site plan with conditions as presented this evening. Um, this is an, a very exciting evening from my perspective, and I am glad to be a part of this reclamation in Roswell's historic district, which will result in a flourishing boutique hotel and enhanced historic district. But before I begin, I would like to take a moment to thank the City of Roswell staff, the DDA, the HPC, the Planning Commission members, and Attorney David Davidson in particular for their due diligence on this project and time invested in this site plan approval request. The staff and the DDA do not recommend approval of a site plan lightly, and I am confident that the Mayor and Council will see that the request of modified safe plan here tonight is in the best interest of the City of Roswell and its residents. I would also like to personally thank Mayor Henry and members of this Council for their time, efforts, and input and openness. The applicant uh, will continue to strive for complete transparency throughout the duration of this project. Um, <clears throat> This evening, we are speaking only about modification of a site plan. It doesn't go to any of the conditional use issues or any use of the property. 
Um, as Councilman Zapata has noted uh, aptly, this project has been in the works for about five years now. The applicant and the team that has been assembled at this time is ready to bring the project across the goal line. They represent the highest caliber of professionals to see the project through. It includes architects, engineers, developers, administration, real estate marketing professionals, operations managers, planners, and of course, legal counsel. The majority of which I want to emphasize are all local. Many times projects that are presented to mayor and council um, here in this chamber include outside folks who do not truly know Roswell, its rich history, its culture, or, or its challenges. We are hopeful that what is being presented this evening bridges all of those areas with a well thought out mixed use design that contemplates and emphasizes the positive aspects of Roswell's past and present as well as its future. I'm thrilled to say that this approximately $90 million investment in Roswell, which can only be described as a win-win for the city and this council and mayor, is being driven primarily by Roswell professionals who are also Roswell residents and citizens. I myself am one of them, both a resident and a small business owner. The proposed modified site plan this evening will continue to serve as a destination point and source of pride for the entire city of Roswell. It also serves to promote mixed use development, redevelopment of aesthetically problematic sites and vacant sites. The modified site plan also will promote and will elevate adjoining businesses and connectivity, exceeding the sidewalk width of eight feet, which I am sure Councilman Palermo is extremely excited about, to 10 feet in many areas to promote health, safety, and welfare of Roswellians. The city has adopted the Together We Are Roswell as a slogan. The proposed site plan contributes to, and I believe imbues, that philosophy. Tonight's modified site plan meets all of the requirements and all conditions proceed and have been met. The recommendations of the zoning director, including recommendations from internal city departments and all applicable external agencies. There's complete compliance with the applicable requirements of the UDC and substantial conformance with the most relevant set of design guidelines. Staff has further determined that the site plan complies with the 2035 comprehensive plan and the 2019 historic district master plan. Uh, as uh, Ms. Dival represented to uh, the Mayor and Council, uh, staff has completely approved all of the conditions and the site plan for this evening. Now, I want to speak specifically as to one of the conditions. Um, Steve Rowe will be up here in a moment and will speak to the site plan details and the conditions. Um, but with respect to one, condition number 13, which was recently added, and we, there's already been some conversation about this in particular. My client is willing to accommodate the condition number 13, but we would respectfully inform the mayor and council that there may be some legal issues with the right-of-way approvals um, concerning this particular um, extension that is being proposed. Uh, particularly, the applicant does not own, nor does it have rights to modify the proposed land in the right-of-way abut abutting the Pegasus uh, Senior Living uh, Center. Um, it also proposes, as Councilmember Judy has already um, noted astutely this evening, that there is a proposed possible health, safety, and welfare issue uh, that probably needs to be worked out. Um, as Council uh, Member Wilsey pointed out, this is not location-specific, um, and it is a recent amendment, and therefore, while we are, will accommodate the uh, uh, condition, we would respectfully request the Council uh, modify it appropriately to address these concerns. Uh, with respect to community meetings, the UDC uh, for modification of a previously adopted site plan does not require any kind of community meetings uh, for modification of a site plan. However, the applicant didn't stop there and its team has taken efforts to consult with other organizations within the city for input. Um, they've spoken with Roswell Inc. led by Steve Stroud, Visit Roswell led by Andy Williams, Roswell Next led by Lindsay Coates, Amy, Amy Gates Stroud, and Stephanie Christensen, the Historic Preservation Commission led by Joanna Benson Spencer, the Downtown Roswell Business Owners Association led by our friend Ryan Pernice, the Roswell Arts Fund led by Scott Hitch, Gate, C Gate City Brewery led by Pat Raines, the Variant Brewery um, with the, uh, the Curling family, and of course uh, I want to note for this council in particular our friends at Roswell United Methodist Church. Uh, there is an agreement that has been reached with the church uh, to ensure that there is parking for employees and customers during the entire construction phases of this project. Um, this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list by any means, but I wanted to just highlight uh, several of the community uh, involvement organizations that uh, the applicant has reached out to and met with. I will now turn it over to Steve Rowe at this time to provide more details to the modification request. Our request is that you vote for unanimous approval, uh, approval of the modified site plan this evening. 
If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer at the conclusion of the presentation by Mr. Rowe. Good evening, Mayor Castle. Uh, Steve Rowe with AEC, 50 Warm Spring Circle, Roswell, Georgia. Um, just want to quickly walk you through um, the project team. Uh, these are the, the local official or the local folks that have been working on this for, for going on probably 18 months uh, in trying to pick this up and, and run this project to the to fruition. So, and here's a quick synopsis of the schedule that we're, that we're under currently within the, the quarter of 2021. We were, we were able to get the concept development approved and the DDA uh, approved our LOI. Uh, Q2 and Q3 of this past year, uh, we had our community meetings that, that Kurt had talked about. Uh, we are in the process of the condition use approval, and then next would be HPC. Uh, the big thing is everyone wants to know when it's going to be completed. And right now we're looking at the, the 22-23 time frame uh, towards the end of 22, early 23, to have this, this wrapped up and, and working. Uh, to the site plan that we're talking about. The site plan will have four levels of parking. We'll enter on the mimosa level into the level one. You will have one level below that down and two levels above. The second level would enter into the Magnolia entrance, which is out on Magnolia. And there are a total of 388 parking spaces within the structured deck itself. Uh, there are some surface parking spaces that bring our, our number up to 397 spaces total. Uh, the majority of the hotel guests will enter the first level of the, or the second level of the parking deck off of the Magnolia entrance. Uh, that would be your first time guest, uh, check-in would be there, drop-off, events facility would be in that location. Um, I do want to bring back the, uh, the, the desal lane in a, in, in a few more minutes. I just want to go through the whole site plan and then we'll talk about that. Um, pedestrian access is not just on three sides of this development. I want to point out that there's a significant pedestrian core that goes along the east side of the project where we've got street trees, we'll have actually uh, architecture that will impact or open up to that and activate that space. So you'll have cross access north-south along the east side of the building. You'll have the, Mag the Magnolia sidewalk at 10 feet, the Mimosa sidewalk at eight, and then also the West Alley will connect you on the back side of the development. West Alley will, will continue. We're gonna rearrange a little bit of it for fire access. We're gonna rework the, the dumpster pad area and then we're also going to create our own service entrance along that same West Alley, trying to keep that as a more of a service entrance and service area for that whole Canton Street corridor. At this point, we'd like to, to talk about possibly removing the desal lane along that for several reasons. Um, and context does matter. And, and this area is meant to be slow speed, it's meant to be pedestrian, and it's meant to be, I think, pedestrian centric, not necessarily car centric. But to mitigate some of the concerns traffic had, we, we put together a couple graphics. And this right here shows you our internal motor court where we're able to stack 30 cars. We're able to stack 30 cars that are on drop off. Uh, all of this would be a valet system where you would drop the car, you drop your bags and you'd move in, the valets would take your cars in. So even if there were no valets moving, we were able to stack 30 cars in this location when the peak hour traffic, according to the traffic study, is 56 trips an hour. So we're able to take almost 45 minutes of cars in and out of this in just our motor court alone. So I think we've been able to, su to suffice that we can, we can stack the cars we need, we can get them off the road safely and, and stack them in here so that we can deal with them on a, on a basis. Um, Magnolia is, is a slow speed road. You're in a short stretch of road between two traffic signals. And really a, a diesel lane is not gonna buy you any more time, it's not gonna add any capacity to the network at the speeds that the cars are going in that, in our opinion. And the most important thing, I really don't think it's appropriate for a historic district to add asphalt for cars. This is a pedestrian-centric situation. This is an area where I think your pedestrian needs to take precedence over vehicles in this area. It's, it's, it's adding asphalt on this would be like adding asphalt on Canton Street. I just don't think it's appropriate. And I think it really matters to get creating the sense of arrival, the sense of thing. And the biggest thing I think to the city is the 12 feet that we're not spending on asphalt can go directly to a larger sidewalk that we can create some really neat features through here, maybe some nice planters, low planters, uh, some, some feature areas within this, this piece. And I think it's important to kind of bring those, those areas up. 
Um, I'd like to introduce Abdul Amir, who is with A&R Traffic, and he is the one that put together our traffic study. And he can get into the more of the details of, of how GDOT would look at this, because those are the standards that we were working under, and why this makes more sense to do it without the diesel lane than with. So I'm just going to introduce Abdul. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Abdul Amir with a and Engineering, Traffic Engineer. I um, just want to comment about a couple of um, roadway improvements discussed earlier, the diesel lane first. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, the speed deceleration lane, by, it's by nature of what it does, it decelerates cars. And when do you need it? By definition, you need it when the cars are going at a highway at a fast speed. City of Roswell code by default re references Georgia DOT standards, which are meant for highways, as to when you need deceleration lane. And that threshold is very, very low. It is 75 cars per day. Think about it, 24 hours in a day, 75 cars you exceed, you need a diesel lane on highway. So per hour, that's a very low bar. Um, for that reason, even Georgia DOT realizes it, um, that their bar is very low. And I have gotten in my career of of a few decade, decades, hundreds of waivers from Georgia DOT uh, for them to waive their requirement and not grant it, not require a deceleration lane in urban situations. Um, not even this urban, Peachtree Road, uh, in pretty good high-speed roads, they've waived it because of the urban net context. And I think it's a perfect location here to waive it. Um, I understand City of Roswell DOT staff position. They're coming from their standards. They're coming from their codes. And I completely understand and respect it. But I think if you look at it in the context of exactly where we are, we're next to the, one of the most busiest intersections in the city of Roswell. Five leg, weird angles. I tried to turn from every direction into this section of road and try to speed as fast as I could to see how fast I could go. With curb on one side, with all weird turns I had to make to get there, and then with flexible delineators on the other side to stop people from turning left into the gas station, it's impossible to speed there. Not to mention the quality of asphalt. It's not an interstate quality either. So you got all kinds of physical, environmental features there that you're not speeding there. So given all this, I think it makes sense to balance. We tend to be car-centric everywhere, especially we traffic engineers, me included. But sometimes we got to think of all modes of transportation in totality. And in, in that context, I would strongly recommend that um, we can eliminate the deceleration lane here and, and cater more to the needs of the pedestrians um, in this area, I think uh, it will not be a bad compromise, and I call it a compromise, because you always have to balance. And so it's nobody's right or wrong, it's a ma matter of balancing. Next, I uh, want to just quickly jump to um, the recommendation from City of Roswell DOT on increasing the turn lane on um, uh, Mimosa Boulevard, the idea of widening or lengthening the turn lane storage certainly has some benefit to it in terms of accommodating the number of cars that'll stack there. And um, as long as it's, it's practical to widen that um, within the existing right of way, as the attorney reflected, that may be something, something the developer can consider. But again, one thing I want to point to is that per city codes, um, you're, su you're supposed to mitigate impacts um, caused by the development. The development barely changes the level of service or the delay at this intersection of Mimosa and um, you know, the signalized intersection there, but it does add some queuing. I, I wouldn't dispute that, and there is some benefit to doing it, if at all possible. If I had a choice to make him do one, I would say, let's do on the memos, uh, uh, the extension of the lane, but not do the diesel lane, given where we are at in, in, uh, near downtown and Roswell here. Um, with that, I'll conclude and, and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Exactly, he, he stole my line. Um, Thank you for their time, and, and we're here to answer any questions you might have on the project. <laughs> Council, have any questions for the applicant? Council Member Palermo. Thank you for the uh, presentation, very thorough presentation. Um, I, I guess, actually, to be honest, my comments more towards this council than the, uh, the, the applicant. It's just, yeah, I, I think we do have to look at, you know, specific, you know, location specific. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'd have a very different position if we were talking about a, a commercial corridor or even even some different roads. And, and basically, the, the reasons being, it was brought up earlier, you know, as, as I think about when I'm going, when I'm driving south on Canton Street, 
so often I will decide to take a right onto Webb and then a left onto Mimosa. And, you know, I end up finding, though, that I, I have to go just as slow and just be as safe because there's so many people walking. And, uh, and, and so I end up, I guess, just doing it. So I'm not seeing all the people fun, having fun sitting outside and I'm just going the other way. But I am concerned that, that with the two lanes right there, are we just encouraging a lot more people in a hurry trying to, trying to cut through still a very walkable uh, area? And then I actually pulled up on my Google Maps and I'm actually just looking at Magnolia towards, towards Pine Grove and I see a 35 mile an hour uh, speed limit and the reason I bring that up is because, as it was mentioned, part of the, the calculation that goes into recommending it is based on the speed, the speed limit here, the, uh, the GDOT you know, uh, calculations, all those different aspects. But, it, but between, between Canton Street and Mimosa, it is really such a short straightaway. And, and just the, the concern, again, on are we negatively impacting the, the pedestrian you know, uh, walkability and safety that we're, we're that we're really trying to achieve, and, and again, my specific goal of expanding our, our walkable downtown. So I guess I just want to make sure with with council we really have a thorough discussion on on, on really what what we do see as the best, and and really not just for this development, but really for the whole for the whole area. Councilmember Wilsey. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Palermo. I would also say that I. I agree with what you're saying, um, and I also appreciate how the applicant has shown us that you can handle the stacking within the deck so that if, car, if there are rush hour cars checking into the hotel that you are able to accommodate that within the building. Um, I think that the, the design without the turn lane really fits much better into the historic district, it adds to the character and the pedestrian experience, and I also think follows suit with what uh, we see in other historic downtowns across the country. So um, yes, I would also support removal of the turn lane. Council Member Tizer. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Rowe, could you put up the slide uh, that shows Magnolia with, with the turn lane in it, uh, that one there? Yes, sir. Um, hadn't really thought about this until I saw the slide. Uh, so to Council Member Palermo's comment, uh, I'm imagining myself coming off of Mimosa, heading uh, towards Canton Street on Magnolia. And as I approach the driveway, I go straight and then I have to make a left-hand turn across the driveway to get to the rest of the sidewalk. If those turn lanes aren't there, I just go straight. It's a straight I think, shot. I think, that's your, I think that's your point. I think it's a, I think it's a very good point. Um, it was the site plan that we inserted that shows what the sidewalk out on Magnolia would look like without the turn lane, yeah. and it's a much, much more enjoyable walk. It's a much more logical transition. You're 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 not looking in two directions for cars coming at you. You really just right. have the one crossing. Right. That that was the point I was trying to make. So, so thank you for that. Um, as as it relates to the um, the uh, Mimosa uh, turn lanes. Yes. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd propose and, and would ask for, um, you know, the opinions of my, of my co-council members, and let me just pull it up here um, quickly. On that turn lane, um, the way I'd like to see a condition read would say that the applicant agrees to add a right turn lane extension from a most of the Pine Grove if in the future RDOT determines it necessary and RDOT obtains the right of way needed. And that takes care of some of the concern, I think, that the applicant has that they won't be able to get uh, the ability to do it and, 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 and get hung up with, with issues around that. So I propose that. And then uh, I, I, think, I think now that I've seen this, uh, that, that, that desal lane probably is, is, is less desirable than I originally would have thought. Yeah, so that, that pedestrian core going north-south, it actually just extends that to the front of the hotel as well. Yes, Councilmember Judy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Sarazzle centric team for taking a dead project and bringing it back to life. Um, I know everybody's looked at the Wells Fargo building, the old Roswell Bank building for me. I used to go in and get, you know, suckers and stuff from there when my parents went. Um, I, not only bringing it back to life, but also 
meeting with citizens and businesses. I was lucky enough to go to one of the meetings and listen to you all take questions from the businesses and actually take the concerns to heart and try to have conversations to work uh, with them on their concerns. Um, so kudos on that. Um, I'm excited for Roswell and hope we can take this across to the finish line. Um, I know we can talk this to death and it'll be six years before we get this done, but hopefully we can get this done tonight and then get this across the finish line. I would support council member um, Tizer's compromise. Um, I think we're, as a council, I've heard a lot of consensus on the, on the desal lane here. I think that allows, if a necessity arises after the um, building of the hotel, uh, I think that will allow us to keep that as an option should um, it turn into an issue. So uh, thanks again to all the hard work. Let's get this done. Let's get Roswell Boutique Hotel downtown. I think it's gonna be awesome for everybody. Council Member Hall. Thank you, Mayor Henry. A um, couple questions. Well, first of all, I'd also like to thank staff for really fast-tracking it. I know that sounds crazy that this has been fast-tracked, but I know that they worked with the applicant. Um, there had been numerous changes, and they provided a lot of assistance to help coach them and guide them so that we could be here today and not another two weeks down the road. So thank you very much for doing that. I do have a question for staff. The proposed preliminary site plan that is here does show that desal lane. Uh, so if there were a um, condition that eliminated that, would they have to provide another site plan to come to council? No, um, if you choose to add a condition to say um, the desal lane um, to be removed, the proposed plan that they would show to the Historic Preservation Commission would then not have the um, desal lane on that. Okay, thank you. Council Member Palermo. So, thank you, Mayor Henry. So it, it does sound like there's a lot of consensus regarding the, uh, the desal lane if I'm hearing correctly. I guess I wanna discuss the Mimosa side a little bit more. Could we pull up the slide that shows the proposal? And I can't remember if that was from the applicant or that was from staff. That was from staff. Could we just pull up that and then I wanna hopefully spark a little discussion. Because I mean, certainly, I, I certainly prefer Councilman Tizer's language over, over the current language. So that, that certainly is an improvement but I wanna just have that, that bigger picture discussion. And, and basically, again, for, for two reasons. One, are we incentivizing more, more cars to wanna to be cutting, cutting through the most side and, and creating you know, any, any pedestrian safety concerns? And, and that might be, it might be something we're, we're, we're comfortable with. I just wanna make sure we have that discussion. And number two is, is this taking away some parking spots on Mimosa? Because if that's the case, that's something I have concern with and, and wonder, you know, the risk versus the reward. I uh, should have clarified that earlier. Uh, with the, can you go, yeah, back one slide. Sorry. Uh, with the graphic shown on the screen, uh, the reason why the impact and the cost would be relatively low is that yes, where you see that dark pavement, that is removing approximately three to four parking spots uh, that we think would be offset by the hundred that they are adding. And they, thank you, and uh, and with that, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm definitely happy with the hundred. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great improvement from back when we had it at 50. That being said, I, I think I'd rather have 104 than, uh, than 100. And, uh, and with it, I think those are convenient uh, place for, for people to park that, that aren't gonna have to go into the parking deck. So again, you know, certainly I support Councilman Tizer's language over over the uh, the original staff recommendation, but I just wanna discuss with this council, is it something we feel strongly that, that, that we do want? And, and the reason I bring that up is because Councilman Tizer's language brings out the opportunity or the possibility where maybe the applicant doesn't move forward with it, but again, to the point, we wanna see this get moving and I don't want there to be this, you know, this, this distraction if it's not something that we feel is providing a great public good. Additional, yes, Council Member Zapata. Thank you, Mayor. So, 
So regarding, I would prefer to lose four spot, Councilor Palermo, than have 104. Uh, in order to make a better flow of traffic, and might be a once in a lifetime opportunity to improve this from now on the future. So giving up four parking spots when across the street you have 100, I think that uh, I had personally weighed more traffic flow versus losing four parking spots. So, but it might be something that seems like I'm going to lose this one, but that's fine. So, um, but my question is very basic question to the applicant, and uh, very basic question, but very important, is what kind of guarantees this new team will bring to the people of Roswell in terms of financial strength, construction expertise, and operational expertise as well. Because we've seen in the past applicants here who are missing one or two, or some of them, three of them, and then make a project to wait four, five, six years. And I can give you a few examples in the city that uh, I'm not going to do it tonight. But, you know, I don't know if the applicant can bring forward this information to guarantee the people of Roswell that this time, this time is for sure, and this time is serious, and this time is going to happen. Because we've been waiting, as the people of Roswell, since 2017 and maybe a year before that. So I don't know if, if the applicant can share with us and the people of Roswell what kind of guarantees this time this new group is bringing that in four years from now, we're going to see the building and not be sitting here, some of us, listening to the same story. Councilmember Zapata, I think I can take that. Uh, sitting here today is Will Gill, and, and uh, he is the owner of West Alley, and um, the rest of the team, there's representatives here from the entire team. Um, in terms of guarantees, uh, there could not be a more comprehensive team that I personally have seen. I, I mean, I've done, been doing this for a very long time as a lawyer, um, and this, this particular team has expertise that I have not seen for this project in the past. There were gaps, there were flaws, there were all kinds of problems in the past. Um, we can represent that this is a comprehensive solution and if there's a close to a guarantee that a lawyer could ever give, this would be it. Council Member Palermo. Thank you. Uh, I think, as always, Councilman Zapata and I disagree, but I think we do it respectfully. And so, uh, you know, with it, I, I certainly hear, hear that point, and, and for if there's long-term improvements that can be made, I always want to make those. Here, what I, what I see is the potential downsides is, of course, the, the four spots being better than, than not having those, those four spots. And in addition to that, what I feel I've often seen is when there's a second lane, it doesn't, if there's one lane backup, by adding the second lane, it doesn't, it doesn't take away the backup. It just so often uh, adds some more, more backup. And so just really is, is this little stretch a beneficial place to have that uh, that second lane, and and I, again, I, I question it. So I, I'd be I'd be curious if if council chooses to weigh in a little little, little strong poll. But again, I think we're really close, and and definitely hoping which whichever way we decide that we can have some unanimous support for for hopefully an exciting project. Council Member Wilsey. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council Member Palermo. Um, I. I'm glad you also brought up parking. I think that's another addition that this project brings to downtown Roswell that's very much needed. And I uh, greatly uh, appreciate you working with the citizens and with the city to bring not just 50 from the previous project, but 100. Um, also agree that making a better pedestrian experience and maximizing parking is a good option. If that so, if removing a desal lane on Mimosa as well is a possibility, um, I would be in favor of that as well. Councilmember Judy. Um, I'd be in favor of either uh, removing it or the other um, option that Councilmember Tizer brought up earlier. Um, again, I don't want to talk this to death and I want to um, get going here, so I'd prefer us to move on. Councilmember Tizer. I feel really weird trying to mitigate a dispute between Council Member Zapata and Council Member Palermo. <laughs> um, you know, I walk that every day or every other day. Um, 
I, I really can't tell you whether it's an issue or not. I listened to the traffic engineer um, who, who, who said he'd prefer not to have the decel lane. I, I, I have to agree with you on that one. Uh, but you're somewhat undecided on the other. And so, uh, you know, keeping the option open might be good, although I don't have a problem saying, you know, this isn't part of, you know, necessarily part of this project. Let's see what happens. And if, if, if we do have a problem with stacking there, we'll come back and fix it. Additional comments, questions from council? Now we'd like to hear from the public. Is there anyone that would like to come forward and speak? I'd like to remind you all to please fill out a comment card and place it up at the podium when you come forward. Yes, ma'am, please come forward. Janet Russell, Roswell resident since 1973, still waiting for my sidewalks. Uh, a couple of things. I see the whole area more organically than all of you or the project people. Uh, but when and if the Oxbow Road project is ever completed, people are going to cut through that little cut through to Mimosa to turn left to go to Highway 120 or to turn right to go to Pine Grove Road to go home to East Cobb. They are not going to turn left on Highway 9 and go to a traffic light at the square to wait at another traffic light at the square to turn right on 120. They are going to take the shortest way home, which is going to put a lot of stress on that intersection at Magnolia and Mimosa, which is already a horrible mess. I agree with you about not needing a decel lane because deceleration implies that somebody is actually accelerating. There is no acceleration going once you turn right from Canton Street to, Magno to uh, Magnolia. None. Never. Day or night. You cannot accelerate at all. So what a waste of time talking all this time about a decel lane when there's no deceleration. Now, as far as for the history of that little extension that goes back to Webb Street, none of you were present except maybe Mr. Davidson, when Mayor Wood was the, was the mayor here, and he had his brother, who lived in Shanghai, China, give us the idea to make Webb Street continue out to Canton Street to be a nice little cut through. And we said, no, not just no, but hell no. But his brother yielded a lot of influence. And we got that. And as far as I'm concerned, that is a death trap. Mr. Tizer says, made the joke, ha ha, I knew there was no sidewalks either. But what I have suggested for years as a tourism professional for over 40 years around the world is that that, from where the Mimosa extension turns right to Webb Street, that becomes a paved promenade alley like they have done in downtown Marietta right off of the square. That becomes part of a plaza without having to do one more thing. Nobody turns right or left in that little area. It's a shame all those little shops got kicked out and then waited for four years because that would have created that small business atmosphere that you want and that people are looking for, those daytime visitors that we don't have anymore because all we have is bars and restaurants. So I think you need to reconsider that. I'll remind you it only took five years to build the Golden Gate Bridge. Think about that. Five years to build the Golden Gate Bridge. We're going to be eight or nine years. That traffic study that the RDOT has done about the impact at Magnolia and Mimosa will be totally irrelevant by the time this hotel is built because maybe the Oxbow Road project will be done by then. And I'm going to tell you, mark my words, I know this corridor well. You know I don't blow smoke. I know exactly what I'm talking about or I wouldn't be up here. Now, as far as the hotel goes, I wish them all the luck in the world. I could give you a whole professional opinion about a hotel in that location, but I won't because I've not been paid to do that. But I am telling you that we don't need a decel lane. That's a joke. We don't need to have through traffic going around to Canton Street because people that hang out at the bar at Salt are already onto the street. And you know that area that's like from Ceviche over to Webb Street? People think that's already a crosswalk between the two crosswalks. They just walk straight across. So why not make it a promenade and end the problem and save lives? Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to come forward and speak?
Seeing no one approach, uh, do we have a motion? Council Member Hall. Thank you, Mayor Henry. Yes, I'm ready to make a motion. So how many years later? <laughs> um, I will motion for item Item number six, approval of CU 2021 2600, 37 Magnolia Street, changes to the pre previously approved site plan. Motion to approve with the following conditions and changes. So <laughs> bear with me as I go through them. Going through the recommended conditions, starting with number one, that that be changed to from 50 to 100 public parking spaces. Condition number two will stay as is. Three as is. M Mayor Henry, would you like me to read the conditions or just if I in in list the numbers? If Jackie would show them as she's going through them, we stopped at two. Okay. There you go. Okay, number three as is. Uh, four as is, five as is, six as is, seven as is, eight as is. Uh, condition number nine, to be changed to read that the owner developer shall provide a minimum, minimum of eight foot sidewalk along Webb Street and Mimosa Boulevard and a minimum of 10 foot sidewalk along Magnolia Street in either in accordance or alignment with the bike ped master plan. Number 10 as is, 11 as is, number 12 as is, and I believe I here that we have consensus from this council to eliminate number 13. And that is my motion. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second by Council Member Judy. Okay. Clarifying questions. Council Member Tyson. Thank you. Um, would you uh, add to your motion the elimination of the decel lane on uh, Magnolia? Thank you. Yes, I would like to amend my motion to include the elimination of the desal lane as depicted on the preliminary site plan that's been presented on Magnolia. Council Member Judy, you concur. Thank you. Council Member Palermo. I thought I was going to have no clarifying questions, but then you threw in one sentence that I just want clarification probably from, uh, from RDOT. So, the ten, minimum 10 foot sidewalks, I was, I was good with that, that was perfectly clear. But then when you throw in, in accordance with the bike ped master plan, is that potentially changing it where staff would have the authority to, to reduce it to eight feet or any, anything like that? I just wanna make sure that without a doubt it's crystal clear to the developer and to staff that no matter what, it's a minimum of 10 feet. Ms. Stivel, I believe Mr. Del Ross is gonna come forward. One second, if you all bear with us. We have no problem with the motion, including a minimum of 10 feet, uh, referencing the hub and spoke map and the bike pedestrian plan. Um, the site plan is showing 10 feet currently, so we don't see an issue. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. I have a clarifying question. Yes. Condition number two, I know you said stays as is, but condition number one, you added 100 park, public parking. Condition number two also related to that, where it talked about the parking agreement, so indicate the 50 spaces. Do you want to change that to 100 as well? Council Member Hall. Yes. Thank Council you. Council Member Judy. Yes. <laughs> Any further clarifying questions? I think we've got it set. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And it passes unanimously. And thank you all very much.
The applicant has put a lot of hard work into this. I know a lot of hours, a lot of late night hours, and we thank you and appreciate it and look forward to the project. <laughs> and I'll rent a bulldozer for you if you need it. <laughs> so the next item on the agenda is Transportation Department, Council Member Matt Tizer. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number seven. Approval for the mayor and or interim city administrator to modify KCI's contract in the amount of $43,675 for additional design services and approval to shift the King Road concept to the west side of King Road and extend the multi-use trail to State Route 92. Mr. Alfred. Thank you, Councilmember Tizer. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So we had a brief about this one at the committee, uh, so I'm going to try not to go into too much details. So this is a graphic of the area. You see uh, King Road going side to side. And north is to the right of the screen, and Highway 92 is to the left of the screen. So the issues along uh, King Road for a, for a number of years are the traffic congestion caused by the school traffic, and uh, the major issue is some of that traffic during school time backing up into the Highway 92 intersection, making it, uh, making it uh, operational and a safety problem. So our project, as you can see, is to extend uh, this drop lane as you're going north on King Road, the outside northbound lane uh, drops. Uh, so the project was to extend that lane into the senior student uh, parking lot. That would be a huge operational improvement and make the roadway and the intersection in 92 much safer. So that was the initial project concept. So uh, again, we were also going to do a, a multi-use trail on the Roswell High School side, and the cost estimate for the project was $400,000, excluding uh, the right-of-way and the utility relocation, which were going to be minor costs. So the concept was preferred because uh, it required widening only to the one side, the school side, and the possibility of right-of-way donation from the Fulton County Schools. But what happened was, so from the very beginning of the project, we were aware of this 24-inch uh, AGL gas line. And we have worked with them uh, endlessly, literally doing more studies, us doing more studies, AGL doing more studies. But there is just no possible way to make it work, uh, make this project build on that side of the street. It's just not feasible. and. Uh, so we, we, it took us a long time, but that's the back and forth it takes us to resolve these severe utility issues with the utility companies. In most cases, in most project cases, we are able to resolve that issue one way or the other, but in this case, we just cannot. We are, we, so the recommendation is to move the whole project concept to the other side, which would be the public side. So. This would be the new concept of the project. So all the widening is to the west, which is the public side. And you could look at that, the little blue lines, uh, that's the public right of way. So you could tell that there is not going to be much right of way impact on that, that side either. We expect minimal utility costs, if, if any. Uh, so we could still keep the same lane configuration. A lot of lanes will have to shift, but we will be able to provide that extension of the drop lane into the senior uh, uh, parking lot. So what happens, and then at the committee meeting, there was a suggestion to extend the multi-use trail that we are proposing on the public side now to extend it all the way to 92. So it would be a couple hundred feet extension of the, of the multi-use trail that we are gonna build as part of this project on the public side. So knowing that, uh, the estimated redesign fee to the west side is 43, about $43,000. And the updated construction cost estimate with this multi-use trail, it goes up. Uh, the initial estimate with the other concept was $400,000. This could, uh, uh, probably be about $620,000, and again, excluding right away and utility relocation, which we don't think is going to be any large amounts. 
so staff's recommendation is to modify the consultant's contract uh, in the amount of $43,675 and approve the uh, shift of the project concept to the west side, which is the public side, including the multi-use trail and extending the multi-use trail to Highway 92. So we have about $450,000 in the, in, the, in the project and we are requesting 43,000 out of that uh, for this ch design change order. Uh, and when we get to the consultant, uh, the construction time, we will need uh, some more money for, to build the project. Any questions? Council, have any questions? Council Member Judy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mohammed. On um, I, the last slide said 620. Sorry, one back. 620. Um, can you give us a top end number here? I mean, I just don't, you know, I don't know if you can or not. I know you can't give me any guarantees, but um, obviously we don't want to all of a sudden have a $1.25 million project here. I can tell you, as based on what we know today, it should not be too far off of the $620,000 number unless we come up with something unforeseen. We, we don't think it's gonna be a problem. The right of way looks okay. We'll just have to verify that. We'll probably will not need any more. Utility relocation is generally on the utility companies any, anyway. The city does not pay unless it was in a state DOT right of way, which is not the case here, or they had prior rights, or there's some other complications, but we don't see that here. But just for the construction, and you know, again, the construction costs have been escalating. I don't know how long are they gonna keep on escalating. So, and we, we don't necessarily have to build a project after it is designed. We can always wait for the market to slow down. Uh, yeah. The current request for approval is only for the design. How quickly do you think you can get to this once we get it redesigned and, and going? That, you know, obviously that will depend on the cost of materials, et cetera, but uh, kind of a timeline on this. On the construction or mm -hmm. the design work? Construction. Okay, so we already have a consultant that's gone. They have a task order open. The design, redesign work is gonna be quick. Um, it should not take more than three to six months, so we'd be ready for construction. And we'd ask for the construction funding as part of the next fiscal year probably, and we can have this conversation at that time. Thank you. Council Member Hall. Thank you, Mayor Henry. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, nice, great presentation. Um, this is a much needed improvement for that area, for the high school, for everybody that um, travels that area. And I'm very, very excited that um, you're able to show that extra couple hundred feet of extending that um, multi-use trail to, to 92. That's really going to make this strip look great. Thank you. Councilmember Palermo. Thank you, appreciate the, uh, the presentation and the discussion. Now, um, I, I believe as I, I, got, I got with you uh, afterwards at the last committee meeting, and you reminded me the actual, there's a picture of the pedestrian refuge on there, and I guess just my question is, is A, confirming I'm seeing that right, that there are pedestrian refuges, and number two, wanting, which, which I think are important, and I was glad council you know, unanimously supported that committee when I had first brought it up, but number two, wanting to make sure none of them are blocking any of the, the businesses, entrance, exits, anything like that, but uh, I just want to confirm those two things. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, uh, uh, I should have mentioned that there's two refuge islands shown on the project, and that's how they place them. They should not block anybody's access. Uh, it, it may take away somebody's ability to turn uh, from a center uh, island area. That may happen, but it should not, it, it will not uh, completely take away anybody's, any of the business's opportunity to make a left out or a right out. Okay, and so, okay, so a left out or a right out. So, so you're saying it might prevent someone from being in a center lane, yes. but it will not prevent anybody from taking a left or a right into, uh, into a business. Exactly. If you look at this business, I am pointing at it uh, maybe just south of the, of the daycare. 
making a left out of here. There is this median now right there, but they'll just have to wait for a gap yep. in both direction of traffic to make their choice. I, I just want to make sure the businesses all have left left and right capabilities Absolutely. remaining, as, as well as making it safer for the kids that refuse to cross on the crosswalk. Absolutely. Yep. Council Member Tizer. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is uh, certainly a well-needed uh, project. Um, tonight, we're approving $43,675 for design, and then we'll see you at a later date for the approval of the actual uh, project. Is that Construction. Correct? That's yes, correct? Sir. Yes, sir. If there's no other questions, I'd move to approve item number seven. Council Member Zapata. Thank you, Mayor. So, this is a project that Mayor and Council already approved. So my question here is how this change from the operational point of view, what they already approved, Mayor and Council, different design versus this new design, uh, what will be the operational impact, positive or negative, with the new design? Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned, the lane configurations, they may have to shift a little to the west towards the public side. But there is no change in the way any of the existing operations are along King Road. The only change is our project, which is extending the drop lane into the senior student parking lot. That's really the only change. The traffic point of view operation won't make any difference, one design versus the new design? Uh, no, sir. We haven't heard from the public yet. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak? Seeing no motion, I'll entertain that um, motion, Council Member Tizer. All right, motion to approve item number seven. Motion by Council Member Tizer to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Judy and Wilsey. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And it passes unanimously. Mr. Davidson. Thank you, Mayor. The only item I have is a recommendation for closure to discuss personnel litigation and real estate. Do I have a motion? Motion to go to closure. Motion by Council Member Tizer. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Wilsey. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And it passes unanimously. We are adjourned.